No. June 21st, regular Still meeting of the Zoning Commission to yeah. order at 703. Um, so this is all the hot metal first stuff. First order of business is the appointment of alternates. I don't think we need alternates tonight. Um, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, okay, so the first order after that is the approval of the minutes of the June 5th regular meeting. Anybody have any comments on the uh, minutes of June 6th? June 5th. Wasn't here. Are you going to say something? No. 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 Okay. I just had one thing on line 92. There's a little bit of a. Uh, Yeah, there's a sentence there that didn't really make sense. Right, there's two words. It says, uh, it uses the word removing, and it should be removal. So it's the word in French. So you take out oh, two words and just put in the word removal. Yeah. Can you say that again? Just like removal? <coughs> the yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, okay. I can't find my line. To no, it's 92. Oh, you're, you're, you're right. You're right. It's right in the middle. Got it. Oh, okay. You're right. It says the removing, and that should simply be removal. We're looking at right. the... Yeah. Looking at the Minor. minutes from last time. Yes, yeah, you, you were not the last minute. No, no. Okay. Uh, with that change, I, I uh, hope that we yeah, accept the minutes as yeah. Any other comments? Any second? I'll second it. Second by Ann. Further comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I wasn't here. I'm you can same. still vote. New rules. Uh, <laughs> yeah. On the minutes where I wasn't here? Yeah. I'm abstaining. She's going to abstain. <laughs> okay. Um, four to nothing, right? All right. Two abstentions. Okay. The minutes are approved. Next order of business is a public hearing. Um, application ZC 23-24, Prospect Enterprises, LLC. Owner, is Paul Vitaliona. Vitaliona. Vitaliano, sorry, Paul, well, um, a VHB applicant, special exception pursuant to section 4.4 to allow up to a 50% increase in the maximum coverage allowed in a B2 zone, and a special exception pursuant to section 4.5 to permit a plus or minus 2,400 foot square foot restaurant as part of a site plan with, along with a plus or minus, oh, that's great, there's two restaurants, a 2325 square foot restaurant as part of site plan, along with an 11, plus or minus 11,600 square foot retail building and drive up ATM at 1263 Hot Meadow Street, formerly Wagner Ford. Assessor's map, okay. 105 okay. block. Okay. 403, lot 018, or 018, oh, zone B2. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, the, um, the applicant is here. He's got a full team, I, so I would defer any staff comments and let the applicant uh, make the presentation. Okay. Please come and use the podium and uh, start with your name and address, please. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. I am Greg Nanny, N-A-N-N-I, and I'm the general manager of Prospect Enterprises, and Prospect Enterprises is the management and development agent for the owner, 1285 Hop Metal. So uh, uh, the application really speaks for itself. I am accompanied tonight by our engineers at VHB. Uh, and our architect, BKA, um, and we'd like to start out tonight by introducing Charlie Baker, who is a traffic engineer with VHP. Excuse me. Change his name. Change the order, yeah. <laughs> All the <laughs> belly out. All the <laughs> The full plan set? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This. 
This is the traffic engineer talking, so I think I saw traffic. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Chairman and yeah. Commission members. Um, as Greg said, my name is Paul Vitaliano. I'm a civil engineer with VHB. We're located in Wethersfield, Connecticut. Um, Charlie Baker is our traffic engineer. He will be up next um, after I go through the site a little bit and then I'll hand it off to um, the architects and they'll, they'll talk about that. We have a lot of renderings and graphics to show you. Um, I'd like to start over here with the site plan. Um, as Greg mentioned, just to give you some context on the site, I'm sure everyone's familiar. I'm sure everyone's familiar, but uh, for the publics as well. Um, this is the former Wagner Ford site. Um, to the right on this plan is the, which is, is the north, is Big Y. And you can see that building to the right, right here. Uh, the Dunkin' Donuts is, is down this way. And um, this is actually um, vacant. It's actually over, it's kind of storage area in the back. Um, and there is um, residential development here on, is it, is it Ellie Place or Eli Place? I'm not. Eli. Eli. Eli, thank you. So Eli Place there. Um, and the site, as was mentioned, is currently vacant. It has been vacant for, for several years. So what, we're, in the, we're in the B2 zone um, with the Level A Aquifer Protection Zone. And as was mentioned, we're here for a special exception, um, not only for the restaurant, but also because we're asking to increase the allowable impervious area by 50%. The That's regulation is 40%. So we're asking that it be increased another 20% to 60%. To put that in perspective, I'll talk about this later. The site is currently 80% impervious. So we're still actually reducing it. So the site itself is, as was mentioned, this is a Chipotle here that we're proposing. Starbucks on the left side and an 11,000 square foot retail building in the back and a drive up ATM in this location. So we have two access points to the site, one off Hot Metal Street, which is a right in and a left in entrance and a right out entrance only. Um, and Charlie will speak more about this later as well. Um, we are also utilizing the signal at Big Y because there is a cross access agreement to basically have this connection here that lines up with the building. So really uh, two points of, of access. Um, and we'll explain, like I said, we'll explain that later. So okay. if you come into the site, I'm just gonna walk you through it or drive you through it, if you will. So when you come in, you could take a right into the Chipotle area. The Chipotle, you could park or you could circulate into the pickup area, which is this here. You can see the cars stacked. It also does have um, a lane here for an exit and actually an entrance as well. So the thing about Chipotle's that we want to talk about is this is not a traditional drive through where you drive up and order and then pick up your, your food. Um, like let's say actually like the Starbucks is going to be, which I'll talk about. So this Ch Chipotle is going to function as an, as an app order. So basically you order on the app. Um, you, they, they text you or tell you the time that you're picking up and that's when you go get your food. So th these drive through queues are not um, what you would traditionally see for a fast food restaurant. That's why they're not as long and your wait time is less because you're basically coming when you know your order is ready. If for some reason your order is not ready, there are designated parking spaces that you wait and someone will come out and bring you your order. Um, there is also, you could also dine inside. That's why we have parking spaces and there is a patio area outside here as well. <clears throat> Excuse me, earlier today we were with the Design Review Commission and they did give a, a positive referral um, to this. Um, so the architectural plans that you see will, will show more about how that patio works and what the buildings look like. So we'll save that, save that for a little later. So the Starbucks, if you want to enter the Starbucks as you come in, there's an entrance here that is strictly for the parking lot in this area here. Um, or you continue further up and this is the entrance to the drive through So the drive through is separate from the parking area. Um, the drive through you could see you circulate around and exit or you combine with the parking lot here and then you could exit out where you could take a, a right to come down to hot metal where you can only take a right out or you could take a left and you're, you're back, um, come back out to the big Y signal where then you could go north on hot metal. Um, so the Star <coughs> Starbucks also has outdoor seating in this area here. Um, you could see that we have what's called a Y lane for ordering, which is basically a split in the drive through lane. This is basically to um, make sure we extended our queue we knew that that was something that was very important on how the drive throughs function and the traffic for that. And typically these Starbucks we know um, could get a significant amount of, of cars at the queue. 
Um, 15 is actually a high number. That's what the DOT likes to basically say that for these high users like Dunkin' and Starbucks, that's what they like to see. Um, we're actually beyond that by the time you get to here. I, I apologize, I forgot the number. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So we actually have more stacking by the time you get to here. So the, our main entrance drive is not gonna see the cars. If, it, if for some reason it did, the one thing we wanna stress and one thing we were very cognizant of, it will not impact Top Metal Street. Cars will not back up to that. It would be, um, we'd be the only coffee game in the three surrounding towns if that ever happened. It, it's, we have significant queue there and that's something that um, we all wanted to do to keep this clear. Um, continuing through the site, if you continue this way, you can see here there is a driveway up here. There's another little entrance here, which is for the ATM. Um, so the ATM is located right here. Um, Chase would be our user for that. And we're told that they only need stacking for two or three cars. We have about four or five here. So they're comfortable with this arrangement. Um, the other entrance that will lead up this way comes into the parking field for this building, which is 11,600 square feet. There is no tenant for that building at the moment. Um, obviously, Greg is working on that, and we don't know if it would be. Obviously, one user would be great, but we anticipate that that would probably be broken it up. It looks like you had more than one. The, the way we drew the architecturals, which you'll see later, is for the anticipation that would be more than one user. I think we're showing it as three or three or four, yeah. and they'll discuss that. Um, but I just want to point out there is no user at the moment. Um, and part of the reason for this jog as well, this, this turn up here, is because there is a elevation difference between the front and the back of the site. Um, to put in perspective, these two front buildings are approximately five feet higher than, than the curb cut here. And by the time you get to the back, you're actually 15 feet higher. So you're, you're kind of up, up elevated there. Um, and like I said, the cross connection to Big Wise is right here. Let's see. Um, we obviously have pedestrian connections as well. That was very important <coughs> to us. We know that there's an ongoing sidewalk program along the Hot Metal Road. Our sidewalks are actually constructed right now. We're unfortunately going to have to make some modifications to that, but we're going to stick to the design, um, <coughs> design aesthetic and details that were provided for that. So the sidewalk will basically continue along our frontage, connect across the big Y and continue this way. Um, we have separate entry points to our site because of that topography that I mentioned. So right here is one sidewalk that leads up to Chipotle. Um, and on this side, we have a separate sidewalk that comes up and connects to Starbucks and then also continues all the way up to this building as well. Um, the landscaping, there is a minor change from what was submitted in your packet as far as what the landscaping is. Part of that, um, we're balancing a lot of different different things here. There was comments from design review. There's also comments from the town engineer about not having certain large trees near a sidewalk. There is also um, concerns from our tenants about view sheds. So we discussed it with the design review. A couple of things we did is change some species of trees to crab apples. That was a comment that we received. <clears throat> Excuse me. We removed some of the large trees along the front replace them with some lower shrubs, um, mostly in this area and in this area. And we added a stone wall um, here and a piece of a stone wall here to kind of keep the theme that's going on in front of Big Y. If you notice, there's a couple of breaks of stone walls or like different segments. So we're basically continuing that theme and that would be the same same kind of stone type that, that you would see out there if you're familiar with that, with that at all. So just to get to some of the the drainage aspects because it does play into our special exception. Um, as I mentioned, the regulations allow for 40% and per we are asking for 60%. And like I mentioned right now, if you go, the site is completely paved, so it's 80%. So we're still gonna have a reduction to what's there now. And as you can see, we're, we're adding a lot of green space to the site. Um, we're beautifying it from what's there now, adding vegetation. Um, we're actually decreasing the runoff from the site because of that decreasing the pervious that I mentioned. And on top of that, we wanted to um, adhere to the guidelines that the town has for groundwater recharge. So there's actually, we're gonna take the roof water from this building and infiltrate it here, the roof water from here and infiltrate it. And we're gonna have an infiltration basin here, um, which is gonna be vegetated and planted. It's gonna, it's gonna be shallow. It's really kind of a feature uh, more than a stormwater management thing. It functions both ways, but we thought it would be an asset and look nice with the plantings that we have around there. 
Um, and obviously water quality systems or water quality units. Um, there's a couple of water quality units to treat the water before it goes off to the state. We're gonna connect to the existing system that crosses hot metal right there. Um, really that's it from uh, like that standpoint. We are working with the utility companies just to make sure that everything's to their liking. We don't foresee any issues. We have been talking to WPCA. We don't have their formal comments yet. We do have comments from the town engineer. Um, we haven't responded yet. Um, we're, we're comfortable that we could respond to all of them. We do want to talk about the entranceway. He did ask if you have his comments, you'll see that he yep. asked us to consider whether that should be a right in only drive. Um, Mr. Baker, when he comes up and talks about traffic, we'll talk about that. We feel that that is better to not have that be a write in only uh, because it, well, I'll let Charlie talk about that. And it's also something that we do, we do want. So I do plan on talking to the town engineer and, and seeing if we could um, maintain this configuration the way we have. We also have received preliminary comments from the DOT. They did not comment on that entrance, which basically they commented on some minor things, but not that. They said their traffic operations is looking at the signal because that's what they do. They send it to another department. We know that the signal should not be an issue. So, um, so we're comfortable that DOT is in agreement with us. And now we'll talk to uh, Mr. Kessler uh, to discuss the other entrance. Look through that. So Mr. Chairman, with that, um, I'd like to hand it over to Charlie to talk about traffic, but if you'd like to answer quite or ask questions now about the site, I'd be happy to do that as well. Okay, anybody have questions on the site? Um, we have some yeah. members that haven't been here all that long on the Zoning Commission, and you mentioned infiltration fairly quickly and move your pointer all around. Could you talk about that a little more slowly in a little more detail? I'd be glad to. No one ever asked me to do that, which is why. It's <laughs> 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 so the town of Simsbury does have guidelines for um, how to handle stormwater. Um, they ask that water be basically infiltrated into the ground. Um, so it's called stormwater recharge. Um, it's a way to recharge the aquifer, which we are in the grade eight aquifer, as I mentioned. Um, it's also a way to reduce runoff leaving the site. Um, that's important because you don't wanna have flooding downstream. You don't wanna push your water out to someone else. So what the infiltration system does is it's basically gonna collect our roof water with the traditional downspouts and piping, and it would go to an underground piping system that would sit right here. And there's going to be another one right in this location, too, that takes the water from this roof. And basically, those are arched plastic chambers that go under, under the parking lot. So you would not see them. You could drive over them. And as the water goes into that, we are completing some geotechnical investigations this week, which is some, another comment that Mr. Kessler asked for some clarification on. Um, we know that there's really good sand out there. Um, so we're going to confirm that with our investigation, or at least prove that we have confirmed it. And basically what happens is that roof water goes into that sand, it's gonna infiltrate into the ground and it doesn't leave the site. So what that does is it reduces the amount of water that makes it into the pipes that goes out to the streams. It goes into basically the groundwater and recharges the aquifer. And the reason we're doing the roof, we're infiltrating the roof is because that's a cleaner water than taking the parking lot. So you're not taking the oils, the sediment, the floatables from the parking lot, you're just taking that roof water. What we're doing on this side um, really, like I said, we, we did it partially for an aesthetic too, um, is an infiltration basin. So this is a shallow depression that's in the grass. So unlike the underground piping, this would be a feature that you would walk by and you would see and it'd be planted. And the water basically is gonna come down this side and enter that basin and once again, infiltrate and recharge the groundwater. Any overflow, there is a pipe that comes across because as I mentioned, here's the pipe that crosses Hot Meadow Street. So this is where our pipes basically converge, but we're taking we're taking three opportunities to infiltrate water. We're also reducing the impervious and that um, it, it meets it, it meets um, the guidelines of the stormwater regulations of the town. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I'm just curious. I, I know that this is obviously a site that's been, you know, was a former dealership and, and there's always been talk about remediation and contamination. And I'm just curious what um, what kind of efforts you guys are doing to clean up the site? Um, Greg, are you, do you have any insight on that? I know that the site has been monitored. There's monitoring wells there, but um, is there anything you'd like to say about that? Or yeah. <clears throat> our, our 
firm has actually uh, owned that property since the early 1960s. Uh, uh, original uh, born and raised resident, uh, Charlie Gersten <coughs> of uh, Terrafil. Uh, he and his brother Morris bought that back in the 1960s and they leased it to the Wagners. And so the, the Wagner Ford dealership had a lease agreement with our firm which provided for it to be liable for uh, any environmental impacts that occurred as a result of their uh, auto dealership there. And so um, over the years, uh, it became known that there wa were certain sources of pollution on site. Uh, and so they had the site fully characterized by a licensed environmental practitioner and there was a lot of correspondence that went on between that LEP uh, and the DEEP. So the site is fully characterized right now. We realize the, you know, the extent and of the impacts and there is some additional re remediation which is required to be performed before we'll be able to start our activities. Um, so we, we, we actually have a fund that goes back to our to our lease agreement with Wagner's uh, that's there to support paying for uh, those remedial activities. Is you have mon monitoring wells on that property? There are, yeah. How many? Uh, I, I can't say that I know offhand, um, but uh, I, I, again, you know, this is something that was done in concert between the LEP and DEEP. Um, so, there, you know, there's a whole file on this and uh, the, the site is fully characterized and the extent of the, any pollutants that are in the ground is known. It's known, but not by you. Uh, known, but not by me off the top of my head. No. Okay. Yeah. But so, so just, I mean, I feel like this is probably, but I just want to confirm. So obviously that'll all be managed well before any of the building happens. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And is there any documentation or anything, or will we see documentation on that just to? Uh, it, it can be made available to you. Um, you know, there, there are uh, reams of, uh, of, uh, Reports and so forth summary? again. <laughs> Try reading. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, it's fine. I, it's fine. I just wanted to make well, sure. you know, that's what. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? I thought I saw some bike racks um, when I was originally, uh, originally looking at the uh, design here, but I'm not seeing them on this. Where where would those be located? Believe, huh, I'm sorry. This is it's kind of you're right. It's kind of hard to see. I believe there's bike racks right here. Um, basically, right those right there are bike racks. Yep. And then I honestly don't recall. I think for Starbucks, it's right here. Um, yeah, I think they're under the trees. Um, I, I think I think it's right here. If they're not, we could certainly um, oh, we could certainly have those. I was going to say you guys are right right across the road from the the bike lane, which would get you a lot of uh, business from you know Granby and mm -hmm. uh, especially hopefully from Terrafil when that bike lane gets uh, filled in. But um, especially since with with any traffic miti mitigation work that you guys are trying to do seems like making uh, cycling available and easy to do is going to be a huge traffic mitigator. If someone's trying to have a coffee on a Sunday morning instead of driving over there, if they could bike, I think that'd be really important. I think it should yeah, definitely be a priority for the site. Yeah, and I think um, our office is actually designing that bikeway. Um, so I know that our, our, bike, oh. our bike guys were pretty excited about that too. Um, so the connection, the connection would, would really happen through the, the big Y right mm -hmm. here. And then you basically cut across and you know like i said that that's why this is right up to sidewalk yeah so you park your bike there and you come across this way and then here's the patio like you said for that that sure. sunday afternoon outside and, and, and kind of same on this side anything for the retail spot in the back um that retail spot really since it's undefined we we kind of didn't go to that detail but i think that's definitely something we can find a spot for yeah, it's easy enough all right thank you well, along the same lines then if you're coming from the bike path is there a crosswalk is there an opportunity to cross 
I think it's right, wide, right? Right here. Yeah, yeah. It's right on the edge here. Yep. Right. And this is actually a really wide, yeah. flat yeah. crosswalk there. Yeah. That's by the light, so yep. that makes sense. Okay. Oh, there, okay. I, I believe there actually are bike racks at the north. My engineer is telling me that. So, <laughs> so she's already she's a step ahead of me. She already thought of that. Oh, great! And put them somewhere right here. Oh, there you go. Yeah, look at that. Thanks, okay. Katie. So I retract everything I said there. There. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you can continue. Well, that was really. I'd hand it over to Charlie Baker to talk traffic, if that's okay. Yeah. Right, great. Thanks, Paul. Uh, for the record, my name is Charlie Baker. I'm a traffic engineer with VHB. Uh, we prepared a traffic impact study for the project, and I'm just going to briefly summarize the study process and results. The uh, project study area included three signalized intersections along Hop Meadow Street, the Big Y Plaza driveway, Hoskins Road, and Eli Lane, which I correct myself, that's an unsignalized intersection. Um, to evaluate existing conditions at these intersections, we compiled traffic count data uh, during the weekday morning, weekday evening, and Saturday midday peak, tra peak traffic periods, since those are the, the time periods with the highest volume on the road and also the highest volume of traffic generated by this project. We then forecast the traffic volumes generated by the project using industry standard ITE methodology. And since the site will be connected to the big Y, uh, we assume that approximately 10% of the site generated traffic would involve multi-purpose trips that are visiting uh, more than one use on the site. For instance, somebody could be shopping at the big Y and then stopping to visit the Starbucks on their way out of the site. And since you wouldn't actually need to go out onto the road to do both of those trips, we take a 10% reduction in trips for that credit. Um, that 10% rate, um, I, I believe is a little conservative, but that's what was suggested to us by the Connecticut Department of Transportation. <laughs> so that's what we used in our study. Um, we also assumed that a portion of the site generated traffic would involve pass by trips, which are trips that are already passing the site today and might see the Starbucks or the Chipotle on their way by and they decide to stop in. So those pass by trips, although they are turning into our driveway and then exiting the site, they're not actually increasing traffic on Hop Meadow Street since they would have already been passing and they just decided to stop in on their way somewhere else. So based on this forecast, the project is expected to generate 206 trips during the, uh, 206 trips per hour during the weekday morning peak, 168 trips during the weekday afternoon peak, and 256 trips during the Saturday midday peak. And that's the net new trips onto the roadway after factoring in those multi-purpose trips and pass by trips that I mentioned. We then distributed those site generated traffic volumes onto the surrounding roadways and conducted capacity analysis using industry standard synchro software to evaluate how that increase in traffic would affect traffic operations on the surrounding roadway. The capacity analysis results are reported in terms of level of service, which assigns a letter grade similar to a report card, A through F, <clears throat> just to grade how much delay is experienced at the intersections. Um, one difference I want to point out between intersection level of service and a report card, though, is that with signalized intersections in particular, level of service A is generally not a desirable or even attainable goal, because if you do have a signal that's level of service A, it generally means there's no traffic there and perhaps the signal isn't even warranted or it might mean that the intersection has been way over designed with extra travel lanes that you don't need. So most agencies consider level of service D or better to be acceptable operations, whereas E or F would be considered overly congested. So our analysis indicates that the signalized intersections at the big Y and at Hoskins Road currently operate at an overall level of service B or better during the peak traffic periods under existing conditions. And the additional traffic generated by this project will cause a slight degradation to level of service C during the peak traffic periods. Um, the unsignalized intersection at Eli Lane currently operates at level of service C during the peak traffic periods. And the project is expected to cause a similar slight degradation to level of service D. So overall, the project will cause some slight increases in delays, but 
there's surplus capacity on Hot Meadow Street to accommodate that additional traffic. So our conclusion is that the project will not have significant negative impacts on the surrounding roadway and that no um, off-site transportation improvements are needed to increase the capacity of the roadway. Um, and finally, as, as Paul mentioned earlier, there was a comment from the town engineer um, on the driveway configuration suggesting that we change it from its current configuration which allows both left turns and right turns entering to restrict those left turns entering. Um, and in my professional opinion, it, we'd prefer to keep it with the current configuration where you're allowing those left turns in at this location. Um, as you can see on the aerial up there, the left turn lane for the big Y does extend past our site driveway. So anyone turning left into our site driveway will be able to get outside the through lanes um, to wait for a gap in traffic to turn left in there. So they won't be obstructing through traffic while they're waiting to turn left. And by turning left at that location, it allows them to bypass that big Y signal. So if we didn't allow left turns into the driveway at this location, they'd have to pull forward and then turn left at the big Y signal, which is causing additional delays for that signal. So we think allowing left turn lanes, left turns in at that location is, um, while not a huge impact, it is reducing delays at the big Y signal. Um, so it is our preference to, uh, to keep that left turn in movement. Um, and as Paul mentioned earlier, the DOT has reviewed um, this plan and this driveway configuration at the district level, and they did not provide any comments on the driveway configuration. Um, so we, we feel that DOT is also supportive of uh, the driveway as it is. So that concludes my uh, traffic presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions? I have, concerns. Hmm? I have concerns. I have concerns. Big Y, which is far less traffic than this will be, has a right turn only lane to come in from Route 10. There's no reason why this new development should have a left turn entry lane. The traffic is already terrible in that location. And they can't, the new development cannot go off of the left turning lane that is meant for Big Y. That's not striped right. The big Y on the far end has a right only. Has a right only yeah, end. Has a exactly. Here. Yeah. But it has a left there. At the light. At the light. At the light. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So. That, so this should have the exact same thing. It should be a right only to go into it, not a left. But I, I see his point that when you're sitting at the light in the left turn lane. Mm hmm and that light is red, you're waiting for it to turn so you can go into the big Y mm -hmm. entrance. With this configuration and a left turn, you're able to turn into that because traffic will be blocked from coming south. It's not. Yeah, see what worries me is that so the light's red. There's like a you know a certain amount of distance for that left turn lane. So yeah. if all these people are backed up trying to go to Starbucks. Yep. So then all the yeah. people who are like me who want to go to Big Y are, are going to have are behind them and are going to have to go around them and then scooch in and you can't and you and it'll be like where you know the, it's going to be, a, be backed up. a treacherous area. There's not a left turn lane. It starts before the road. That's what I'm saying. Straight. So you'd have to go past where the guys stopped. Yep. Keep going straight and then cut over to the left turn lane to get into the Big Y. Yeah. Ooh. It's okay. Is that you or yes. me? Mm. Yeah. So anyway, so that that's my concern. Yeah. Uh, under, understood, and that, that's a reasonable concern. I, but I'm not okay with DOT not having a concern with it. I live here. This is a concern. <laughs> this is a terrible concern. So I say either you know right turn or none, and it's only at Big Y. I, I'm inclined to agree with you guys. I, I I see what you were trying to say that it would reduce congestion, but it also seems like it creates more conflict mm -hmm. points. If someone like. Sure, they could wait for it to be a red light before turning in, but they don't have to. They could try to shoot the gap on a green light. Like I, I don't see what the cost of having it be right turn only is. I mean, they can still access the place just fine just hit the next with left. the light yeah. in place. Yeah. Just hit the I don't next like left. that. Doesn't. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't really see. I don't see really many ups, upsides to having that be left turn. I, I you, you guys disagree, but I, I'm. Yeah, well, I mean, we, can you explain to me why you thought that that would like what the idea is there is that they would be able to just kind of sneak out while the light was red is that the idea and that would what reduce the lineup at the at the light 
Correct. And, and okay. to, to take your point, it, it does increase conflicts. Yeah. Um, any anytime you have a driveway on a road that creates right. conflicts. Yeah. Um, so really, it's not a matter of reducing conflicts to the extent you can. It's just sure. deciding which which conflicts are reasonable right. and which ones are creating an undue hazard. Right. And, yeah. and in this case, we we do not feel that that's an unreasonable situation. There are, there are many driveways along this stretch of road that allow left turns into them. Um, yeah. I didn't see any unique um, safety concern with this one. It is. And it does, <laughs> and it, 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 it does provide the benefit that it allows them to bypass the signal. And um, the, one of the reasons why DOT preference is generally to allow left turns in, in this mm -hmm. situation, unless there is um, a very good reason to restrict it, is that it's very difficult to design that driveway that doesn't just encourage illegal left turns in. So the road's wide enough that if we, if we channelized it similar to the way we have our right turn um, channelized movement, you're still going to be able to turn left into there unless you actually put a physical median on Hop Meadow Street, mm -hmm. preventing everyone, anyone from passing that point. <clears throat> yeah, which, which isn't, isn't something that DOT would support in this location. Right. So if we did, yeah. if we did restrict those left turns in, in this, at this location, it, it's inevitable that when somebody pulls up to the site and they see the red light in front of them, there are going to be people that just make that left turn anyway, because mm -hmm. it's virtually impossible to design it such that yeah. you can't make that left turn. The so, one at Big Y is very difficult. You cannot make a left turn up there. There's a right turn only that's not on this page. It's not in this photo. Mm -hmm. You cannot take a left turn into there. It would be almost an S curve in order to get your car yeah. in. So there is a way to design it. They did. Okay. Yeah. I, there, there's you could just you could just wind them out, right? At, at little cost to the. I guess like, I don't see the negative in just having the that left turn be mediated by the light. Like you're, you, you say you can't eliminate all conflict. That's true. But what you can do is have a a, a signalized. Uh, a signalized intersection, which at least has something determining when you can and can't can't move, as opposed to. And you're right, yeah. I mean, like people take the wrong turn out of all the time. Like the Cumbies up at uh, up in uh, Windsor is notorious for not allowing a left turn out, and yet somehow mm. people manage to do it. <laughs> um, but still, I mean, you don't. If, we don't necessarily have to make that easy for them, and we could make it look as though that that's not what's intended, either through just a sign or just kind of splaying out the. Uh, the the entrance here or the exit i guess um granted you guys are the engineers but i don't i don't what's the cost in that it's, it seems like it's the same amount of material same amount of space sure I, just one more point i'd like to make about mm -hmm. the safety is that we we did review three years of crash records in the area mm -hmm. with the study intersections and there were less than five crashes over a three-year mm -hmm. period at um, the big Y signal and at Hoskins Road. So this isn't a high crash area. Mm -hmm. So we, we did not see any elevated safety concerns in this area. And this driveway design is, is pretty consistent with many others along Hop Meadow Street and, and many others that we've designed on, on many of our projects. So we just, we just didn't see any unique safety concerns that um, told us that that left turn restriction was necessary. It, it's not about crashes, it's about traffic flow. And there's people that live in the North End that are very frustrated right now, how the configuration is. That's without these two more developments, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you want to talk to DOT and ask them to make it a longer left turn signal, that would be wonderful. That will speed up the traffic queuing at that light. That's what DOT could help us with. So our, our analysis showed that that left turn into the big Y does not have excessive queuing um i've been out there a right, couple of but times if we have and i all don't the traffic go there to turn left to go into starbucks then it will have more queuing if if we restricted left turns into our driveway yes. then there would be more queues right. mm -hmm. so the big could signal. help with that light they could help keep the traffic yeah moving. well that's, that's exactly right we it's a, it's just as easy as painting the lines a little bit longer and then who cares if they're queuing for the left as long as they're not stopping people from Passing traveling forward exactly go, yeah yeah to go north you know um, but I mean, that's you're you're not DOT, so that's not really mm -hmm. our. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's let's move on. We understand there's several people who would like to see a different configuration at that entrance. 
um, and maybe there's some creative way to to solve our concern. But let's let that hang for a bit. Sure. Uh, any other questions, comments on the in how many trips did you say would be generated in an hour on the morning? Pull up that number. Uh, approximately, it would be 206 in the morning per hour, 168 in the afternoon per hour, and 256 on a Saturday peak. That's on. That's additional on top of what the traffic would be normally. Correct. So, what does the total become? The the total, the total number of trips. Uh, turning in and out of the driveways, like the total number of cars going by there, you've got 206 that you've added to it. Yep. What was the traffic before you added the 200? What's the total? The total, including what's there today, plus our traffic yeah. on Hop Meadow Street, is um, five to, uh, 519 to 736 in the northbound direction. That's the range. And um, five, about 550 to 624 in the southbound direction okay. per we, hour. We, the numbers I've seen in the past are like 8,000 cars a day go up and down. So that's consistent with that. Yes, yes it is. Kind of assessment, okay. Yep. So you're adding 30% or, or thereabouts? Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, le less than 10, I believe. It's not you, but people coming to, yeah. people coming <laughs> to get coffee. Because, um, <laughs> the, the numbers I was quoting were bi-directional, going to the south and the north. Yes. So the, the combined in both directions today is, depending on what, which peak you're looking at, is somewhere between 1,000 to 1,300. Okay. So we're adding around 200 to that. Okay. I want to know. Any other comments? Okay, why don't you continue on? Um, thank you. So thank you. now we'd like to bring up our architects. Um, okay. They'll go over some of the items we just talked about with DRB. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, and members of the board. Um, my name is Doug Gruner, and I'm with the firm of BKA Architects. And we're the architect of record for the project. With me is Michael Barago, who is uh, prepared to speak about uh, anything, any questions about Chipotle or Starbucks operations specifically. So I'm going to start with the first rendering here. This basically, this is an overall of the site to kind of give you an idea of what the architecture of the buildings is going to be. You can actually also see the elevation change of the building in the rear that Mr. Vitaliano alluded to right here. Um, this is right along Hot Metal Street showing that curb cut we were just discussing. Uh, the front materials uh, we've actually just added because, um, as per uh, DRB's um, comments, uh, we added a sandstone retaining wall along here for the landscaping as well as that element for the, uh, the signage element at the front too. One more up, please. Uh, this is heading northbound on Hot Meadow. This is actually gives you a better idea of what the roofs uh, would actually look like on the two restaurants, the Chipotle and the Starbucks. Uh, the equipment will be uh, screened uh, with the parapets as shown, and the roofs will be drained either versus with um, downspouts on the outside of the building or roof drains on the interior of the building, which is the case of the Chipotle. And we'll be going into the underground storm water management system that Mr. Battagliano explained to you. One more down, please. And this is southbound on Hot Metal Street. Uh, you can see a little bit more about the uh, materiality of the architecture. Um, so we are using um, hard materials on the, on the bottoms of both of these buildings, uh, glass, metals, masonry, and softer materials on the top, which is the drive it uh, and or wood. Um, it's a little harder to see in the rear in this picture, but that's also uh, it's a similar um, dichotomy uh, of the architecture of that building as well. 
One more down, please. Uh, this is the main curb cut coming in where you can actually visually see that great change right there. So you can actually see this is actually higher than these two buildings. Uh, this building back here is designed to supplement uh, the uh, architecture of these two buildings, uh, essentially uh, with materiality. Uh, one more down, please. Um, so this is the building that's um, the retail building that uh, the tenant is to be determined. And right now it's shown for multiple tenants. So we're illustrating here of how a use of materiality, horizontals and verticals breaking up the facade, can actually uh, aid uh, multiple tenants and whatnot. But this building could also be designed for a single tenant as well too. Uh, the materials are uh, cementitious. We're um, doing a, a, a horizontal uh, design on the two bookends here, and then a vertical in the middle there too to tie it all in. Um, the materials, they're still being determined, but this is pretty much what the color palette we're gonna be going with, and most likely be a cementitious, like a Nietzscheha product. And we're also going to be implementing the sandstone in this brick base as well too. So as I said, the bottom here is a harder material, and the top is a softer material. Here you can also see the, the proportionality of the facades as well too. Uh, one more down please. Another uh, image of that building as well. Kind of give it a little bit more close up. You can actually see the articulation of the uh, textures of the materials. Um, the two bookends, uh, well, actually, we have varying awnings throughout. We actually have more of an um, overhanging plane on the element of the tenant on the left as well. And, and then we have more of an awning element, a pitched awning element on these tenants here. One more, please. And then this is the opposite side where you can actually see, oh, we actually did variation too. We did a, a flat awning as well there. One more. Keep going. So this is the Starbucks. So the materiality, as I alluded to, is uh, harder materials on the on the bottom. You got the, uh, the metal of your storefront, your glass, and this is basically a gray masonry. Um, the lighting on the outside is all downlit and pretty much all of dark sky compliant, no up lighting at all. And the top portion is a light cream drive it. And then that we have this uh, material called Sansuji bond, which is a burnt um, Japanese wood. And basically, they just take a wood and basically they take a blowtorch and char it. It's designed to preserve the wood and actually help with the weatherproofing, but it actually also gives you a nice texture when the, um, when the process is complete. Um, that's pretty much uh, what is capping uh, the entirety of the storefront here. So basically, mm -hmm. If you basically use these two materials, it's almost like a separate element, the glass there. Um, like the Chipotle as well, too, um, visibility is important to both uh, Starbucks and Chipotle. They like a visibility for the patrons out, as well as visibility into their operations. Um, they use a lot of nice materials, nice finishes, so the interior is very pleasing to look at. Um, one more down, please. Um, this is the rear of the Starbucks uh, drive through as I said, the, uh, the roof is drained through these downspouts here that's going to be going into the stormwater management system. Um, and that, that creamy drive it basically caps the entirety of the top portion there. Um, the drive through is a, a bumped out element by about five feet or so. And it's essentially designed to be its own uh, separate element, essentially. And um, it has that Sansuji bond uh, wood pretty much uh, from top to bottom to give it a more of a cohesive look. Um, the top of it is, for weather protection is uh, capped with this, um, this flat awning. And then inside there's actually a nice uh, wood, um, I don't want to say trellis, but um, batten essentially uh, to basic cladding to uh, uh, hide any structural elements. So it actually gives it a nice look. Thing done. And then this is the Chipotle. Uh, here we have actually more of a, a light gray drive it and then a dark gray drive it on the bottom. Here actually we do have two, uh, we have soft materials actually on the top and the bottom, but this actually is um, uh, more of the harder material, which is the uh, aluminum storefront and the glazing. Uh, one more down, please. Uh, this is the side where you can actually uh, see the visibility into the store that I just illumined. Uh, alluded to. And then this also has those flat canopies out front uh, to match the storefront material. 
Um, this actually has more glass than actual drive it as well too, so that's actually why they use the softer material on the, on the bottom. Here you can actually uh, see the, the, um, the patio that we're proposing for the Chipotle. Uh, it's seasonal uh, and it's basically contained within this fencing. Uh, the Starbucks is also proposed to have a patio as well, too, but we're still working with them on the layout, so we didn't really show oh, it okay. specifically on this. Okay. Yes, there's actually that concrete apron out in front of Starbucks. That's where it's proposed. Okay. One more down, please. Uh, these are just the colored elevations of the Chipotle to kind of give you more of a 2D uh, image of the building. You can actually see where the glazing is um, and um, the, the, uh, the extents of the drive and whatnot on the the sides that uh, were not visible in the uh, rendering. Yeah. Uh, this is southbound on Hot Meadow Street, uh, just passing uh, the, the Starbucks there, which is the last building on the site. This actually also shows some of the context of the existing site to just basically show you how the new um, proposed project will um, complement the existing architecture. This is northbound on Hot Meadow Street, and we also have the big Y in the background uh, to actually also show you how it complements as well. Um, this is the Sansuji bond material I alluded to. So basically the process, um, you can actually see it here. This is a very sunny day, actually uh, really makes the texture um, essentially pop right off the page and whatnot. And you can actually see um, how it how very different it is where in the sunlight versus the shade essentially it's a darker material but um, it's, it's, it's a very nice looking material this is the chipotle as well too these are the color palettes this is the light gray I alluded to and the dark gray as well there um, this basically kind of gives you a little bit more of a um, a direct uh, view of the actual proposed colors there and whatnot I think that's the last slide is it? Last slide. And with that, I welcome any questions that you might have. Okay. Start on the right this time. I don't have, to, I don't have any questions, no. <laughs> Tony? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the context that you're trying to share with everyone. That, that greatly appreciated. But um, do you, are you familiar with your immediate neighbor to the west? Uh, my recollection is there's apartment buildings either built or being built. Mm -hmm. I think three-story apartment buildings right on the other side of that property line. And all I see are trees. Am I mistaken? Or is it the fact that they're not built? Oh, this is tall. I don't be having this uh, back here. I'm not sure. I don't think there's anything behind. Yeah, no, behind, 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 behind the big one. Existing townhouses in the rear. Yeah. It's not, um, there's not yeah. three-story apartments adjacent to this property. Okay. Okay. No. No. Yeah, dire directly to the west is an ex the. Right, I thought it was part of the affordable housing. No, that's the UI place and, uh, development. Uh, yeah, it's further north. It actually, right? yeah. it's yeah. 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 Further north. you said that's yeah. Yeah. So there's existing. I don't know. They're duplexes or. Um, they're smaller. They're smaller. Yeah, there's units there. I I don't remember how many, but it's it's, it's a short road that has those. Um, yeah. We actually took care. If you look at the if you look at the plan here. Um, we actually, instead of grading this out, because then we would lose these very mature tall trees, we actually put a very short retaining wall here, like two or three feet, just because we want to stop the grading so that we don't interfere with, with what's there. Otherwise, we easily could have lost the wall, but all these trees would go. So these trees are very tall. They're very mature, yeah. um, and we're, we're keeping them. So you, want, you really don't see through so there. So that is the Eli Lane apartments. That, right. Yeah, that is Eli Lane. And then just yes. for, for further orientation, of course, we have Big Y. And then this is the, uh, the rear portion of, this, of right. the skating center. Yep. Is there any, I mean, I know it's not your property, so I'm not sure, but maybe George, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, as a former hockey mom, I could see kids like when they're stuck at the rink all day, they would love to be able to walk down and go to yeah. Starbucks to go to- I think they already do that. And I think they do that to go to Big Y. They do? Yeah, okay, um, I wasn't sure. Yeah, I think curious. if I could, if I could only half answer that. <laughs> I, yeah. I'll take it. The reason I say that is because I, I looked at the, I studied the big white plans. Um, you know, obviously I had to, to, to connect and it looked like there was supposed to be a connection here with, this is very steep down here. Oh. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And it looked like in the plans I saw, there was supposed to be some kind of connection and you can see that's like kind of half built, I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that that was continued, but the, the reason I'm bringing that up is that 
Um, I don't think that really affects us. I think you already probably have something hmm. in place or something that should have been there or potentially yeah. is going to be there. Or maybe I don't recall it and it is there, but someone had thought along those lines at one point. Okay, I was just curious. It's that yeah. would be that'd be another way to to cut down on traffic is right. you would hate for Eli Place people to have to drive here. It's, it's right, right there, you know. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's not your property per se. So, yeah, but that's something we can, we, can right. look at we, we definitely want to be able to make a connection from these folks to here. Plus, we sure. also don't know, you know, how they could have sidewalks sure, or whatever. Sure, sure. And there, there is still a, some steepness here, and anything we do would impact the trees. So, I guess what I was pointing out is yeah. big why. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay. What, you okay? Thank you. Yeah. George will look at it. I just have a question about the storefronts for both sure. of the building. Is it this, is it a, the same storefront? I mean, it'd be nice if a consistent storefront could tie the two buildings together. This building here, it's to, to be determined. So well, that's, the, the that's storefront the might change, but Mostly yes, the, the other two are with dark. that amount of glazing at the bottom. It'd be nice if the storefronts were the same. They are okay. dark bronze aluminum storefront. Okay. Very exciting. You didn't touch on it, but trash. Trash. I, can I could see it in the back. <coughs> yes. Yeah, so um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I can answer if you like. So um, basically, each tenant has their own. Um, so the Chipotle has their area here, um, which you could trust me on the truck movements. Um, I believe there actually might even be in the plan set, but they would access the dumpster from here. The Starbucks is in this location, so it would actually come in, grab it here, back up, and leave this way. It's kind of a reverse gate turn. And then this in the back <coughs> is determined, but um, is obviously tucked away in this corner here where they would come around and grab it. So out of, out of sight here. These are pretty standard for these guys. We moved them away from the patios, um, kind of screened them as best we could, but that's pretty prototypical for them. There's also proximity to their doors, so they're not walking too far when they come out. Okay. So there's there's actually sidewalk path here that's um, hatched. So they look tan. Oh, I'm sorry. On the on the other plan too. I think she's trying to see if it's visible on the on the render. Oh, yeah. so, you just go to like a site plan render. You can see what the uh, yeah. uh, uh, I'd be a overall. Yeah. One, one, of, one of the first two first two users show. Maybe this is a good one. No. And they don't look really screened. I mean, they look like there's a couple of trees, but I don't know that that's really going to screen them. Did DR, no, did design review see anything? Um, they did not okay. Okay. Anybody mentioned bear proof? So, so this is, this is one of them here. Yep. Try to get one closer. Thank you. So I think it's that tan enclosure. Mm -hmm. This one's a Starbucks one. Yeah, pretty standard. And the other one's kind of stuck back there. And this one's right here. I kind of see it here on the right side. So, George, did Design Review, did they talk about one screening and then Diane brought up um, bear? Bear proofing, bear activity? So that was not a focus of their conversation. <laughs> yeah. It just would be a suggestion. It was not. We have a lot of bears. <laughs> okay. Dave, I just want to clarify. Yeah. Uh, your plan then is to close, is to have this Starbucks replace the other Starbucks on Hot Meadow? No, that's not so. That's not so? So we're going to have two Starbucks. Okay. That was my question. The, the rumor that's going around is that this other Starbucks is closing. Okay, but it's not. But it's not. Okay. It's not. Okay. Thank you. They're not. A, they don't have anything to do with it. No, I, I understand that, but there are. <laughs> there is another one right down the road. So. Okay. Go ahead. So. Chipotle. It's going to be app only for ordering. George, how does that work? So people that don't know are going to drive in, don't realize that they have to order prior to going through the drive-in. Are there going to be signs? Like, I don't know how that's handled from a brand new building perspective. Right. Ms. Babas, if, if I could direct that comment to, they've got an operations guy I here. Agree. Uh, answer that question. <laughs> so let uh, him answer that. So Chipotle, I think I should yeah, come up and at least tell us who you are. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael Barago. I'm a project manager for BK Architects, mostly working with Chipotle uh, clients. Um, so the way that the app works is you come in, you order on the app, 
it gives you a time that your order will be ready. Right. And so the idea is you drive up when it will be ready. And so the queue line typically is no longer than six. And that's at that's peak hours because you're just pulling in. There is no ordering. There is no exchanging of money. That all happens on the app. So there's not that time taking. Here's, it's really just you pull up, you show them the app, and they hand you your food. If for some reason your order is not ready, so you come a little bit earlier, they're running a little bit late, yep. um, there are three spots. You can actually see them right there, numbered one, two, three yep. in the front, and they say pull into one of those spots and we will run out your food to you when you're ready. And so it's meant to be a very quick process of here's your food, you, you are now, you know, ready to go on your way. So there's six parking spots in the front and then Five it, on it, it's also a regular restaurant, right? Well, yes. You don't have to use the app. No, you do not. You do not have to use the app. You can that's also go inside. Of, oh, okay. That's part of my concern. What if you're coming from out of Simsbury? You don't understand that it's app. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there enough parking for somebody who's coming from out of town, drives by, sees Chipotle, then realizes they have to order on the app? So now they're sitting, and. Yeah, so, so this is a full operational restaurant inside as well. You can come in, there's plenty of seating, there's a patio seating. Okay. Um, there's also a mobile pickup shelf inside as well. If you order on, online, you can go inside and pick it up inside okay. the store, not just through. Um, and there is no like menu board or any other science to that effect in the drive-through lane. So as you're going through the drive-through lane, um, get to do anything anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah, you, right. You, you can't really do anything. And then there is a pass through. Like you can see it's kind of double wide there on that side. Yep. So if you realize, oh, I you can can't, go around. I can, you can go around. You can pull into a parking spot. But we do. Uh, we did plan enough, or v, uh, VHB planned enough parking for the drive through and um, to patrons. accommodate people that don't know the drive through procedure yet. It's yes. my concern. I'm not so concerned with the drive through. Yes, but mm -hmm. more people that need to park until they realize mm -hmm. how this operates. And, they, and there are parking spaces on three sides of the building as, okay. as you circulate around. Okay. Yeah, and obviously this this was this was obviously reviewed by Chipotle, um, so it, it's it's new to Connecticut this kind of thing. Um, it, it's it, it's happened in other parts of the country. I know I just did two Shake Shacks that are doing this. Okay. So it is kind of a new newer thing, and obviously they know their model better than we do because I had the same questions you did. And they reviewed it, and they were comfortable with the number of parking spaces. They had a I, could, number we had it. I could just add to that, because um, I've been to one of these um, in the state of Washington, around the Seattle area. And it, it actually really does work very well. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know about the sh people who don't want to use the app. That would be my question. I think you just clarified it. So when you were originally presenting it, I, my interpretation was that it was only by app. Yeah. But now you're oh. saying it's both. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But no, in terms of ordering on the app, they give you a time, you put the kids in the car, <laughs> you drive, and they, they literally hand it to you. Okay. It's, it's simple. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yep. Okay. Are we ready for the public? Sure. Okay. Anyone in the public care to speak to this application? We'll all rush up at once. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, D David, yeah. regarding my traffic. Excuse me. Yeah. Could could you come up to the podium and say your name and look at your address, please? My name is Al Weisbrick. Uh, I'm at the Three Lenore Drive uh, in West Simsbury. Um, I was just looking at the uh, traffic flow and the comments that were made about uh, being able to turn at the light and having the extra lane to turn. The, the one thing that jumped out at me was the egg, if someone could bring up that particular uh, frame where you see the whole facility. The whole site? The whole site. That's the one, right? And, and, and blow it up a little bit so you can get the see a little closer up uh, the uh, uh, exit and entryway, uh, especially at the Hob Meadow. That's it right there. And you notice there's only a right turn out, but you have a left turn in. Is that the only way you can get out? Uh, or is there another uh, way to come out and then go north? Or are you forced to go right as you're coming out and have to find a way to go turn around 
and go north. It, there's an inner parcel, so you can get right back out to the light here. Okay, so you have to go over towards the big Y access road, yeah. in essence. To go yes. north and go to the light. Yes. Go there. Okay, all right, very good. That was my primary uh, question on that. Good question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, kind of, kind of Anyone else? Yes. About, right. Which are efficient, but yeah, key. Hi, my name is Lisa Hamill, 97 East Retog Street in Simsbury. My question is regarding the actual retail space. It seems like we're giving a lot more opportunities for businesses to come in town. So specifically, why another Starbucks? And have we thought about the impact on the other surrounding businesses, in particular Antonio's? Um, there's a Farley Max down the street. We have another Starbucks within a very close proximity. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any thought around that and if somebody can speak to who makes the decisions about what businesses go into these rental spaces. OK. I, this is an opportunity for you to speak about the application that's here. Um, that's you've made your comment, and that's um, not something that anybody can answer. I mean, we we don't decide who goes where. We don't say you can't have a Starbucks here. That's not our role. It, our role is to be. Uh, determine whether or not that's a safe place, whether it's appropriate in terms of traffic and character of the area. Um, but we can't say Starbucks over something else. Um, that's not our role. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Anyone else? Okay. Mr. Chairman, I do have just, just um, I, I did receive one, and I don't think this got into your um, stack. And I, I did receive one email. It is from uh, an Eric Litsky. And I'll just read the sentence. Uh, I've resided at 10 Wyndham Drive for more than 40 years. Uh, please include this as my strong support for the project being developed at Hot Meadow Street, comprising Starbucks and Chipotle. This is exactly com the kind of development we need in Simsbury to enhance our tax base. <clears throat> I'll make that part of the record. Thank you very much. I think there are staff has has indicated there's some number of issues. There's a staff's position on this. I mean, if you saw the, the staff report, there's not, a, there's not a recommendation of approval. Um, we're obviously quite supportive of redevelopment of the site. Uh, we think there's a number of engineering issues and kind of site detail issues that we, we, want, we would like to continue to work with the applicant on. I think the applicant understands that it is, is, and is in agreement with that. And so we would recommend you continue the public hearing. So there's also some additional information you asked for tonight. I would recommend continuing the public hearing to your next meeting, which is July 17. Oh, I said, yeah, I'm almost certain. That's July what you said 17. for design review, yeah. too. Yeah. 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 Which is what I was getting to. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Somebody want to make a motion to continue this public hearing to July 17th? I will make a motion to continue the public hearing of, of ZC 23-24 until our next meeting on July 17th. I'll second it. Second by Donna. Diane made the motion. Donna seconded it. So we double these. <laughs> okay. Any further comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And abstain. Okay, so the continuation passed 6 nothing. No abstentions. Okay, since we are uh, continuing this public hearing, uh, we will not take up the application GC 2324. And we're down to general commission, commission business which the first item is a preliminary application presentation of the Hartford South Ridge at Talcott Mountain South. Mr. Mr. Chairman, maybe for, for our new commissioner, just uh, so this is a, a, essentially a presentation from an applicant. We do not have a formal application submitted to date, but it, uh, this commission has always allowed a, a preliminary 
preliminary review, a preliminary presentation where and you can give feedback. It's not necessarily binding, but it gives you a sense of, of what could be coming. So that's the reason for why we call it a preliminary review. Okay, thank you. And the applicant is here? Or a future applicant, I should say. <laughs> Mr. Donahue. Sorry, I'm trying to pull it up now. Yeah. This thing can be a little. We're happy to be here tonight. Yeah, oh, Colton yeah. Zavato from Silverman. Yeah, well, I do Laura like Krosky, Architects, there. and Paul Vitaliano and Kate, the engineering firm of VHP. We've been at work for quite some time on the what's known as the uh, south site or the actual home site of the former 900,000 square foot headquarters of the Hartford Life Insurance Company. The proposed plan, after much work and much analysis, will provide 540 units of residential housing in Simsbury, of which uh, 448 units will be in south, the south development side, uh, apartment type buildings, 22 duplexes will be built, and 70 single family homes for rent will be built. Um, the ridge at Talcott has been successful in every way. Its vacant re vacancy rate is scant. It has happy residents. It's very successful. And it, 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 it has informed the owner that this is a very appropriate uh, development and, and something that the community can, can continue to thrive with. This will be presented by Paul Vitaliano. We'll lay out the site and explain the uh, engineering on it and Laura Krosky will be go through briefly her elevations and her preliminary designs for the buildings we, we're here before you because we've been before you the town is a full partner in in Talcott Ridge and has been since the beginning and actually before the beginning when the Hartford left us and uh, we want to get to you at a very preliminary stage so that we can have a meaningful dialogue back and forth the plan that we present to you tonight has been designed to provide housing for Sims rate and among the housing that will be there will be either some market rate affordable housing if we go with the Hartford form based code zone or 30 G housing if we go with the with the statute it will be statutory or market rate affordable housing that will benefit Sims rate in some degree with this with as proposed and as created. Thanks, TJ. Well, once again, my name is Paul Vitaliano, civil engineer at VHB in Westfield, <laughs> Connecticut. This is my fourth presentation tonight. So if I say Chipotle or Starbucks, please stop me. <laughs> but I hope you understand. Um, so I'm just going to walk through the site a little bit. I'm proud, really, I'm going to start at the entrance and just kind of drive us through the site. Um, we'll take a little, little tour together. Um, so what you see here, for reference, I just want to point out that we did make sure that you could see the north here just for reference you can see that you know that we're separated by by the river um obviously um here's our no, that's not the river. It's the wrong. Stream. <clears throat> here here's the um it's a river so here's the street right here so the two entry points that we have shown here are the existing entry points just for reference um we'll consider this our our main entryway so if you come up into the site there's a roundabout um, in which you could go in either direction, right or left. You could actually also loop up here. Um, so this is a, a cent center green, the same way the north has, but it does have parking um, around it. Um, so in this lower area, what you see with these, these different colors here, these are these, the apartment buildings, the stack flats, if you will, um, 32 units in each building. Um, Ms. Krosky will, will show you the elevations and speak to those. Each one has associated parking. You can see that they're set up in quads, very similar to the north. As you progress through the site, you can see some other, we go from a high density to a, a lower density. So these are duplexes. You can see this different shade of orange here. The little brown behind them are um, garages. So they have like alleyways in between to get to the garages. Um, so those are the duplexes here, the clubhouse here with the pool and other amenities. And then beyond that, as you go to lower density, these are single family homes. And there's different variations of those, which once again, Laura will, will speak to. And the single family homes continue on this side as well. So we're moving from a higher density with the duplexes to a medium density, and then the 
lower densities in, in the back, um, more, more isolated. Um, and once again, just to kind of talk about some of the features here, the, the single family homes, the river is in the back here. Um, and that's where these homes basically are, are buffered by that, that tree line. Um, and here, these are buffered by a tree line as well. Um, there is a residential development right here and some office space here. Um, one thing that's important to note too is that the, the limits that you see here of green, basically our development is almost identical to the limits of pavement that's out there today. So if you look on Google Earth and you see the shape of the parking lot, um, we're basically staying within that developed area. There's a little bit, a little bit encroachment in here and a little bit in here, but for the most part, we're staying within that footprint of what's parking lot and what was building. The building used to be up in this area here. Um, just trying to think about some other features to point out before we go to architecture. Um, these are all connected with sidewalks um, throughout. Um, the last thing I guess I'd point out is that if you if you're familiar with the north, if you drive through that, the type of design features that are in the north from a site standpoint um, are consistent here. What I mean by that is the proximity of the building to the streets, for example, uh, the way where there is on-street parking, the way there's bump outs on the on-street parking, um, the tree belts that are there, um, those kind of separations from road and building. It's very consistent with the north as far as that site design and site layout uh, standpoint. So obviously what's unique here and different from the north is the introduction of the duplexes and the single family homes, um, which um, we, we feel is, is an interesting element to this. And as was mentioned before, these would all be, be rental units. So um, with that, we have to answer any site questions or we can hand it over to our, the architect to go through the building types. We've got site questions, let's get those. Uh, could you just talk about the change in elevation? To, yeah, it's yeah. not a completely flat lot, is it? Um, it's it's not, but the great change isn't really as bad as you think. We're still we're still working through that. Um, obviously, we're here at a preliminary type level to kind of get your feedback. Um, but there really aren't steep steep slopes or any retaining walls or anything like that. Um, there is obviously some initial grade change as you enter the site. Um, but once you once you're in it, it's it's pretty relative to itself. It's it's not there's not like steep roads or steep <clears throat> it, It's really the there's some berms out front and some grade changes as you enter, and that's it. Are well, one of the features of this lot is that it is the the road is lower in the middle yeah. area. Yes. When you look back, um, it's a positive feature because you I agree. see the buildings. Yeah. Right. So yes. don't dismiss it as as not important. It's huge. Yes, I don't believe I said it's not important. What I was saying was that internal, I don't know if you were at, I guess I didn't understand where you were going with the question. Sure. As far as the visibility of the site from the street, it is lower, you're right. Um, the site is lower. So once you're inside it, what I'm saying is that it's relatively flat right. to itself inside. Now, what that means is that from the street, the homes are gonna be very isolated. They're gonna be, it's gonna be quiet neighborhood. They're gonna be hidden from the street they're in the back, you will not see those homes from the street. There's actually a large berm here in the front here. We're, we're probably gonna remove this unit to keep that berm a little more intact. So all of, all of this is actually already hidden by this berm. Um, so the berm is staying, the existing? This ex this berm right here is gonna stay, yes. And the actually- The other side is not? Um, the, other side, the other side has some trees here and some berm area here. This These buildings here are gonna go where if you're out there, you would see a back clump of trees. This building is in that group of trees. So the initial berm in the front is going to stay here. There's a hundred foot buffer from the road to the, let me put it that way. There's a hundred foot buffer from the road to where the parking lot starts okay. in this area here that I'm pointing to. In this side here, this berm, which you can see is kind of a different shade. That's all gonna stay. And there's, there's pockets of wetlands also here and here that we're protecting as well. I'm curious, I mean, as you probably know, the thing that the folks in town like least about all this development at the south end of town is that you can see it like mm. right in your face. Mm. And so the nice thing about the Hartford property was always that it's set back and you can't see it at all. Yeah. So I don't know if that's going to be the same, but is there anything that you have that gives us a visualization of what it would look like from the road? Not yet. And that's the kind of feedback we want to hear from you folks to understand what was important to you and what wasn't. Um, cause obviously it takes some effort to do that. So we sure. want to make sure we were answering your questions correctly. 
Um, just to put it back in perspective, once again, the Hartford used to be back here. So right. yeah. all the way back here. Right. So the berms in the front and the grading were really meant to shield the, they shielded the building because because the building dropped down so, lower, yeah. but they really were meant to shield the parking as well. Hmm. So when you were driving along Hot Meadow, you, you don't even, you wouldn't even see the parking lot. So obviously with our buildings being massed forward a little more, that's gonna be different. We're still gonna be shielding the parking lot, but these these buildings are still gonna be visible because it, okay. it doesn't sink down that far. I would see how much, one, you could retain, and two, possibly build up or add to it. I think that would be looked on very favorable from the residents. Yeah, the less we see the buildings, the better, I think, is the... Yes. I, mean, I know you can't hide them entirely. I'm yeah, not crazy. yeah. But you know, if you could work the, in that direction, yeah. that's the bo the bottoms will will definitely be screened. We'd have to look at what that view really looks like. Okay. I would just add that I think with what they're all coming from is that there's been a lot of different meetings um, around town about affordable housing, mm -hmm. about all the development that's mm -hmm. going on in town, um, and the number sheer number of apartments, and many citizens residents are really upset about it. Mm -hmm. So I think the more attractive you can make them visually from the street mm -hmm. would go a long way. And being, being able to see that would be very helpful. Well, I think that's a great transition to our architect to show you what the elevations look like. Can I just ask like. you one more of question? Of course. Oh, sorry. Go, Mr. Mm -hmm. Oh, My question was, you mentioned the neighbor. I'm guessing that's 126 Hot Meadow. Is the abutting residential? Right here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you already thought of screening I know you said you're leaving some trees I think we need to be very sensitive mm -hmm. to those existing residents there may be somebody in our audience but I think we need to have a buffer there so we are sensitive to that I remember when we did the north yes those neighbors came yes. out and they said to me you didn't think about us and I never forgot that mm -hmm. so you. we did walk this area and look at it there is a there is an elevation change here which we are going to have to dig into to do these houses okay so we are going to make sure that we're vegetated between us yeah. but the way the grade changes we we do have to cut into that now what we did is that at different obviously it's taken a long time to get to this point the reason we settled on this plan too is that this this area here will be the single family homes which is the least um obstructive I, I don't know the word you want to use intrusive uh, sure that th so you know there were iterations where we talked about does an apartment building go here and here and we changed it to this now i don't personally think we're obligated to make sure these people see nothing right. but at the same token we came up with the less dense use we have and at most they're looking through a screen of trees which will block most of the view and then backyard which is basically as how many of us look through our, our window to another neighbor's backyard? You're not looking at the apartment building, but it's the less dense use that we have here. But are those homes higher? They're, they're going to sit higher. I'll need to take a look at that. That's what we. I don't believe they would be. I think they're. I think they're probably on par elevation wise because right now the berm that's there now is much higher currently. But we're going to. When I say the berm, the elevation on this side. I yep. don't want to confuse yep. it with the berm in the front the that, that we right this side. That elevation is going to be dug out. I don't, I don't really think there's a grade change through here. I will look into that, but I don't believe there is. If there is, it's very minimal once we dig yeah, it down. I, I'll offer support for that. My daughter lived in one of those condos mm -hmm. and I used to walk her dog over there. They, the people at the Hartford didn't mind. Well, and when they bought those, let's just say, there was one commercial building at the way back of the site. Mm -hmm. So in fairness, we have to keep that in mind. Well, with all, with all due respect, our, our client owns this property to develop it. I mean, they're not necessarily. Right. We're just asking it. you to be a good neighbor. Right. And I, 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 I hope that what I was saying before about our intentions to not have apartment building there at least is considered. But we will, I will look into your concerns to at least be able to answer it with more clarity. I would like to say that my entire life I've been within visual distance of an apartment building and somehow I managed to get out of bed every morning. So I will say that just like not not being able to see it at all is, is I think probably a, a little unrealistic for this site plan. And I think we can be respectful, but also like these are these are buildings. You're gonna be able to visually see them sometimes. So ask, does this plan have to go through wetlands? Um, we will go through wetlands because we are in the upland review of can wetlands. Can you show me like um, it's essentially 
it's essentially our periphery. So this is like a wetland pocket right here. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously, there's a couple of wetland pockets here. You know, there's there's some stuff here. There's one system here. One thing we're, we're not doing is we're not having any direct impact to the wetlands. We're not filling any wetlands. We're not, if we do touch a wetland, it's because we're upsizing a drainage pipe that's already there. And I'm not even sure yet that we're doing that. So the reason for going to the wetland commission will, will be mostly for our upland review. And a large majority of that upland review is currently parking lot. So meaning that's already disturbed and the commission will consider that that our upland review is not encroaching on cutting down trees or doing that to do it. We're basically replacing parking lot with, in some cases, lawn. Right. And that's our impact to the upland review. Did you We've say, just gone oh. through a few nights of only upland review. <laughs> well, I, th I think it's easy. And so, <laughs> Right. No, I, just, I understand. Just be cautious. Secondly, I, I think one of the things that people said they loved about Simsbury is the rural character mm. of the town. That was one of the things that was pointed out in one of the surveys done around 2006 or seven. And one of the ways it was done is I think that the Planning Commission over the years tried to make sure that most of the developments were not really visible from the road. And I think that's something you should consider in looking at those. I, my view of those four soldiers up front is that they could be replaced by houses that went across there and it would look more like what you see in the rest of Simsbury. And that, to me, that would make sense. I don't know what the economics are. Oh, we understand. That's, that's, a, that's a fair comment. Um, the other thing is that I heard a little bit of a, of a uh, waffle is the wrong word. <laughs> it's got too many connotations. But I think what we want to see is affordable housing as a component of this um, to the, and not market rate, but 10% affordable housing like the state statute asks for. Uh, you could come in with an 830G, that's a different world. Um, but I think the state statutes want 10% in a development like this, deeded affordable so that they count in our uh, moratorium. Mm -hmm. And the 10% the is, is the goal that, that the state asked all towns to, to have. I believe right. Simsbury is around five, potentially yeah. something like that. So, um, do you have anyway, that that would be yes. something that I we, would we do, and and, the, and I'll let TJ talk to that in a minute. The affordable component is something that we're here to understand, also from the town. Well, understand also that we know that you have 300 units on the other side of that drawing that have zero commitment to affordable mm -hmm. housing. Mm -hmm. and we don't feel good about that. There will be an affordable component to this. I could we could guarantee that. Okay. Well, we anybody have any more comments? All right. I'm just gonna say two real quick two little things. Um. I did mention about seeing it from the road. The other thing is the ridge line. That's uh, the other thing that's very sensitive. Um, the, the, the view of the ridge line is being impacted as, as it has been so much. And the other thing, I'm just curious, because you said you're staying within the footprint of the mm -hmm. Hartford property, I'm assuming because of the wetlands. The Hartford parking lot, but yes. The parking lot, yeah. Yes. But I'm just, so what is the difference in impervious surfaces now versus, or in the Hartford's the current situation versus what you're proposing it's this is a huge reduction okay that, that's yeah, right I was just is. curious what the numbers yeah were. that's that's why frankly speaking that's why you don't see any detention ponds on this site okay because um, we're it's it's a reduction everything that's in here in green is currently pavement yeah okay. um, are, there, yes, are there any plans for any mixed-use uh, kind of development any commercial there, there there is not and you know we could speak to that TJ could speak to that as well but obviously that was a component to the north and as everyone here knows, those buildings have sat empty. Um, it's been really difficult for Silverman to find tenants for that. By difficult, I would say impossible. Is that a fair assessment? So there's there's no retail um, mix here. And obviously, this this is also driven by the success of the North, right? Their their leasing is is phenomenal, which is why now they've moved on to the South. When I first started this five, six, seven years ago, maybe more at this point. They said we're not going to look at the south until we know we're successful in the north and that's why we're here today 
And there is one last, if I can make one general comment too, if you go back to the form-based code, you'll see that there were um, alternatives at the end of it, if you will. There were just schematics, but there were drawings in there. Um, believe it or not, this is less dense than all of those. Um, so even from a traffic generation standpoint, th this is actually less than what it was projected at its, at its peak that it could be. I think that almost all of our comments have to do with how it looks from the road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's fair. Well, yeah. so and, why and, don't we, and affordable. And affordable housing. And, and, and we haven't given up on the commercial development. We know the owner of the property feels bad about that, but so do we, and we're not giving up on it. We feel there was a commitment in the beginning to mixed-use development, and that's what we want. Yeah. That's, um, we'll have to consider that. I know that the form-based yeah, code I'm basically sure has a series of uses to pick from, and the form-based code did not regulate that this needed to have a retail component. It, it needed and we're to not either. That's only one of many forms that we could sit here and rattle off of commercial development. Mm. Retail's only one. Mm. But it's the only one they seem to be looking mm. at. I don't know. I don't want to be unfair about their years of search for tenants, mm. but. Okay. Okay, let's, let's move on to. Uh, if we, if we, I know you talked about the views from the street, we'd like to talk about the views inside. If you, if our architect could come and show you that. I'll tell you, leave here because it's it's right. Where is it right in here? Right. Thanks, Paul. I'm Laura Krosky with Krosky Architects out of Hartford, Connecticut. We are the architect involved with the project. Um, here to start us off, we have a um, bird's eye view rendering to really show the feel of how the community is starting to develop. As Paul mentioned, we have three different building types here. We have apartment buildings, which are more at the center of the site. We have duplexes, which start to transition from the higher density to the lower density single families, which run along the edge. Um, and I will run through, um, we have plans and elevations here. Um, we can look at the apartment buildings first. These are uh, relative to the design of the buildings in the north. Um, we have explored a lot of different uh, materials here to try and break down the scale of the building and also create some interest. Um, we want to make sure that the scale starts to get broken down as we are putting it next to uh, duplexes and other single families. Um, so we're looking at uh, stone veneer, um, lap siding, um, uh, metal seamed roofs for a little bit of more decorative of a feel. Um, we have balconies here on many of the apartments as well. We'll look, take a look at the rear. So these apartment buildings have 32 units each. Uh, the first floor uh, rear portion of the building, which is the elevation on the bottom, has um, parking uh, garage spaces. So we have try to break up the elevation here as well with looking at two different uh, garage door styles. Um, and then we can take a quick look at the duplexes. So we have two different duplex building types. Uh, there's a duplex that is in the um, middle of a parcel lot. And then there is a duplex, which is on the corner lots. Uh, I just I know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so the, the building, um, these are side by side uh, townhouse, uh, two bedroom townhouse units. Um, this one is one with the uh, entries at the front. Uh, the building on the corner also is a two bedroom um, townhouse style, but it has a front entry on uh, both sides, so it's addressing the corner. Then we have our single families. We have six different types of single families. These range from three to four bedrooms and they have one to two car garages. Um, we are varying materials here. Uh, we will also vary colors and so that we won't ever have one building next to another building just like it. So our goal is really to 
create more of a traditional New England uh, neighborhood here with this. Um, this is a four bedroom with a two car garage. Um, and you'll notice that we have a variety of um, uh, entryways from you know gables to um, shed entries. Uh, we're also exploring um, bump out bay windows to give some architectural interest as well. Uh, this is another three bedroom, one car garage. Um, you'll see there's nice bay windows. We're also exploring the, the different types of siding materials, uh, lap siding, shake siding to give it more of that New England feel. And another uh, four bedroom, uh, four car, I mean two car garage, excuse me. And uh, two of these styles, uh, one being a three bedroom and one being a four bedroom are uh, handicap accessible. They'll have a master bedroom suite on the first floor um, as well as uh, accessible garages. And that is the, the two bedroom version of that. So the three bedroom has a one car garage? Yes, and the driveway. Um, and then there is the clubhouse, which if you recall from the site plan is at a uh, central portion on a green. Um, this will include a, a pool, a fitness room, um, rentable main hall area for parties or gatherings. Um, and outside there, as I mentioned, there's a pool playground area and a large green space. Uh, and the goal is really to have residents um, enjoy the, the common area in a central location to try and bring the community together. Um, and that is it for that, if there are questions. Um, go ahead, no, go ahead. Can you just give me an idea, um, basic square footages for the uh, single family homes, how big are sure. we talking about? Yeah, so they range from about 2,000 to 2,500 square feet. One comment that hasn't been made here that was made at DRB, these are all rental units, houses included. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wasn't yeah, house, the houses are rental Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so, just for consideration, if you're going to have a three bedroom home, I would really consider adding another garage. Mm -hmm. Just a one think car garage is, is not going to work. You can rent your house, but not just, just a rented. thought. It would take a car off of the street parking it would give parking to a guest or somebody else, but it would also give them that safety and that is likely gonna be a two car family. There, there is also the driveway. I mean, yeah. just, you don't have to keep every car just in the garage. Right, but you have a three or four well, bedroom rental home. Yeah, a two car, two -car garage, garage. assumed, it really is. I don't have one. Mm -hmm. I don't either. <laughs> I live in a two bedroom home. I don't have a garage at all. Yeah. Just park on the street. <laughs> There are a lot of places that don't have garages at all, but I think but people, but but people like yeah. garages. Yeah. They don't have to shovel. Yeah, that's I might have an idea. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, yeah. How many, Tell me. uh, how many uh, single family homes did you say were uh, in this development? This There's about 70 single okay. family and homes. The other development is all apartments, right? The one right. we went to the north. 70 homes. Yeah. And townhouses. So, so just to clarify, so this is all yeah. rental units, the whole mm -hmm. shebang. Correct. Nothing is owner, it's all rental. Okay. I, I lost track of, in the single family category of 70 uh, homes, how many variations are there? Yes, so six there's or seven or something like that. Yes, there's six styles, and then each of those has its mirror image of itself. And each time we would duplicate any one of those, we would be applying a different siding color um, just to create that additional variation so it doesn't feel cookie cutter. Okay, so the number six. Correct. Okay. It's probably too early to know approximately of any idea what you would charge, what a house would rent for. <laughs> It's right to, uh, yeah. That's part of our discussion. It's early. Yeah. 29 to 35 for a single family, I think is probably the range. Yeah. Yeah. We're all going to sell a move. I know, really. <laughs> but that's also to my point of maybe having the second garage when you're paying that. Um, can I ask for a site? We were talking about the view and especially from 
Route 10, if you could move the red buildings to the back and then either move the single family to the front or front uh, corner or the duplexes to the very front. So it would be berm and then either duplex or berm and then single family. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll, take a, we'll take a look at all of that. I know my initial thought to that is that we don't want to mix like different types, like go from single family to apartment back to single family and that. Mm -hmm. um, as we did in the north, we try to do a transition from dense to low. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that we won't look at your first yeah. part of your comment, but I don't think we want to mix them all in together. I'm just asking you whether it's duplex. Mm -hmm. If you want to do just the duplex, then that's fine. And then the apartments and leave the it. single okay. family. Mm -hmm. We got a lot of pushback from the way the North was done. Okay. So if you could bring a lower elevation. We'll take a look. That would be great. Mm -hmm. what, curious, out of curiosity, what's the reason for not wanting to mix the two types of housing? It just looks funny, or is there like a more concrete kind of reason? Yeah, and what we're trying to create with the single family uh, locations is, is more of like that neighborhood feel. Yeah. So you would hate to be the person with the single family house right next to this huge apartment building. It would feel out of context. So well, I, I wouldn't hate that. That's how I grew up. But I suppose. <laughs> but you know, it's, we're trying to make more of the transition, which is why the duplexes are in there between the apartment buildings and the single family. And then we have that nice communal green area with the clubhouse that is also kind of creating that buffer between the apartments and the single family. So. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a lovely development. Again, I think you, you, we've, we've made our concerns clear, you know, as far as the visibility and all that, but it is, it, it looks very nice. One last question, if it, not the last question, but what would be the addition to the grand list? Mr. Chairman, the, uh, your staff called me and asked me about that. And your assessor's records show that today, uh, Silverman is the number one taxpayer in town and contributes 1.9% of the grant list by paying $2.6 million a year in taxes on their property. And using that valuation method and the new mill rate, the total taxes for this development would be $4 million. What percentage of our grant list? Um, Oh, calculate that point. <laughs> 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 what percentage of it? What percentage of the North Piece? The North Piece is 1.9. So it's about 3 or 4%, maybe 5. So and all of us who got tax increases of 8, 9% mm -hmm. should be interested. Well, one thing we didn't talk about is the timeline for building a project of 540 right. units. Yes, we should. We'll get. I think we're very pleased to come in here preliminarily because we're starting to be in every corner of the town hall talking to all the staff and everybody trying to get our plans together. And we don't want to get here last. We want to get here first. That's why we're very pleased that you took us on today. And you've given us quite a good list of, of questions and, and work to do. Good. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, so the answer to my question is, you don't know how long it would take to build out 540 units? Oh, Holden's done it before. <laughs> Well, you've seen the plan. Is that a 10-year plan? The, the north part was more than five years. So is the south piece of property projected to take how long? We would hope it would run a similar timeline to the north site, um, if not quicker, if we could. Similar at the same rate would project to 10 years plus. Uh, not, not ten, I wouldn't say 10 years, no. I would say five years, yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. So I think I think the north. Sorry, Holden. I think the the north is probably like a four four and a half year build, and a lot of that. Um, obviously, this with the single family homes, is, it's it's different. That's that's going to be, you know, just because the scale of this overall site is bigger, it doesn't mean it would exponentially <clears throat> increase that four and a half to ten. I could envision this being the same thing for four years, four or five years. And Paul feels that we won't have COVID and we'll have no supply chain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a Starbucks in the front of the whole animal. George, would we be able to get Board of Education information? Um, <laughs> what we were told for the North was one number of students coming in, enrollment. That is higher. Is it, so what we'll do, um, Jackie, is when we get an application, a formal application like this, 
uh, the Board of Education would be one of our referral agents and we will we will send the entire packet and ask that question. And they'll respond with you know student generation for because there's like single family with. homes here. Yeah. So it's a little bit different. And they'll they'll provide a uh, they'll provide number four as part of that review process. Okay. We also have interesting comparison with Carson Way. That might be another interesting It's comparison. not quite as dense as this. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's move on because we've got other things on the agenda. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, you have questions from the audience? No, it's not a public audience. <laughs> just, an, just an opportunity for them to uh, present their ideas. Do you ask any questions as an informal? Okay. Why? Because we're mean. I know that. But why can't we just ask a question? It's in Because we, we have we have business to do here tonight, and it's already quarter of nine. Anyway, just come ask on. one question. What would you like to ask? There was a presentation made um, about a year ago, preliminary. TJ did it, and there was a component that offered open space to the residents, a, 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 like a road that would lead down to the river. And the initial before they had changed to the individual homes. So now that's no longer in here. And I thought that was going to be an advantage to the town to have another access point, a recreational area in a sense, Okay. the river. Thank that's you. You made question. your comment. It's on the record. Thank you. Okay, George. Um, public notice discussion. Yeah, I mean, it's a shame because the river's right there. Can I sent you a memo? I, 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 since I've been here, um, I've had a number of questions um, from from citizens and from property owners asking, well, what exactly is our public notice requirement? Is there some information, um, like on, 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 uh, on our special exception application, some of our applications um, that, that don't reflect what's in our zoning regulations? And I just want to make sure that this body knew what our what our what our notice requirements were for, for your application might, and maybe how it compares to, to other applications from the planning commission or the zoning board of appeals the point is that they're not entirely consistent across the board and there may be a reason for that but i just i did want to make sure i want to remind you the first thing um state statute requires only a newspaper ad run twice no no more than 15 days and then between 10 and two days. That is the requirement for public hearings that you hold. So for a special exception application, a zone change, a map change, or a text change. Or if you call a public hearing for a special site plan. The state statute allows zoning commissions, as all of our commissions, to, um, to have additional notice. And those additional notices can be either assigned or uh, or notice to adjacent property owners. And you have to do that by adding that regulation to your zoning grants. So the way so we don't have those regulations. And I've been asked a couple of times from, from applicants, do I have to put a sign up? Shouldn't I? Maybe in the past we made folks put signs up. What I what I'm here to tell you tonight is that we don't have that regulation. So it's the, so so. As far as we're concerned, the notice requirements for your public hearings are the newspaper ad only. Oh. So, if you want a different, if you want something different, we would have to change the uh, your zoning regs. And, and I just wanted to, to point out, and I pointed out my memo. You know, the, the Conservation Commission requires um, notice to adjacent property owners within 100 feet. The Zoning Board of Appeals requires a sign, but not notice. So we're a little bit all over the place. Um, I think Planning Commission for a subdivision requires. Um, notice to adjacent property owners within 100 feet. So, just wanted to make sure you knew that, and then there was any direction today or or you know moving forward. Um, you know, I'd be happy to work with you on it, but I did want to make sure you knew that that's what our, our notice requirements were. There was some confusion in the, in the community. I'm curious because, as we know, like newspapers are really a dying breed. So, um, is is 
are things changing in, in the overall world where they're going from newspaper notices to something else? And what else would it be? The town site. Yeah, yeah so I mean, town site. So, yeah. so posting on the on, on the town website yeah. is, um, you know, there's been a, there's been several bills offered over the last three or four years to to exchange that that statute requirement for land use applications instead of doing the, the newspaper ad that, that you do post it in a you know place of significance on the town website, for right. instance, sure. has been defeated. Um, really. Oh, oh, over the last couple of years, yeah, I mean, certainly like newspaper, newspaper, newspaper interests and newspaper <laughs> lobby interests. Yeah. So it's a significant revenue stream for for local sure. newspapers, and so um, I just I just wanted to point that out because I had gotten those questions. What, so. Mr. Chairman, what historically we've done a sign for special exception? Is that it? Well, again, you can't because it's not your regulations. So. I, think right. that, I think that the alcohol. Yeah, things require that's a sign. what it is. It's not the state. It's a state requirement. Okay. Yeah, for, for, for perhaps for alcohol, alcohol. But, but, but as a general rule, we don't. Okay. Years ago, we used to notify abutters. Yeah, in previous we zoning regulations. Stopped doing that. Yeah. I think mostly because the town didn't like the cost and the annoyance and the work. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's on staff to do that. I mean, I, I, yeah, but it used to be on the applicant to do it. Right. You could do that too. Well, you we could do. We that. Used to do that in Simsbury, yeah. Connecticut, mm -hmm. and then somehow. The town was, must have had some great years on the growth in the, the uh, grand list because the town started doing it. And then pretty soon, <clears throat> no one was doing it. And it disappeared from the regulation. But what didn't disappear is the applicants are still required to produce those names on the applications. And yeah. that leads to confusion. Why are they given the names? That's one of the reasons. You're just throwing them in the trash. <laughs> yeah. Right. I and nothing with those most people know it. Property. <laughs> it looks stupid, <laughs> you know? Do you have but, a recommendation? Yeah. I think it ought to be consistent. Right. You know, I, um, I don't think we should be afraid of, of notifying the public. Not at all. No, not at all. Um, so I'd start there. Um, Agree. You know, I, yeah. you know, I, and I think our town cares. You know, they want to be notified. Well, we had the classic case of on a Nod Road. No, what is no. that road? Off Climax. Oh, yes. Oh. The guy wanted to build a... He just knocked down a barn and built a ADU, two stories. Mm -hmm. But his property hit Climax Road, Nod Road, and in the back, the street that comes in off Bushy Hill, it hit three roads. Oh my God. But there was only one sign required for the zone. What we were doing, he put one sign up. Yes. Because that was the requirement. Yes. So the neighbors and the passers by in the other two streets never didn't knew. Know. And some yeah. of them were mad as hell. Yeah. Agreed. Because but they that, weren't informed. But so. that was a case where <laughs> it was about a, I don't know, 40-acre plot. The guy's house was in the center where it used to be a farm. Yep. Yeah. And then they sold lots all around the edge of his property. Mm -hmm. That's and more or so, less true. Yeah. And right. so right. the guy that his, his driveway came out to one of the streets, and it was the guy who had that house who yep. was really... Upset, right? Because he didn't get notified. Out of town now. And both, so, both, it was very quirky. Both of those, <laughs> both yeah. residents are no longer residents of Simsbury. Right. Yeah. They've all moved out. But if he had to put a, if he had to notify all his abutters, he would have had to go around. Correct. That. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. No. By the way. No, but if there's nothing. Force it, him. It, it, you know, you can go the to the uh, assessor's uh, database. You can get. The abutters' yep. names. Oh, yeah. well, the GIS is the yeah. The GIS. Is well, here's a stupid question: How hard is it to make true. a sign? Like, if I were doing something, I'd be I, I wouldn't have the faintest idea how to make up a sign. Like, I mean, aside from just a poster board, and obviously yeah, that's I think not historically the, 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 the planning department staff would make the sign and give it to the applicant okay. for a post. Right, and it's really that. easy. I kind of <laughs> almost like that because again, without newspapers, you know, you drive by, you see the sign, you know something's going on. I think it's a better idea to have the applicant notify all the abutters. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, but the, only, the only question I would have there, since we're having a conversation about it, is um, not every applicant is the Silverman Group. And so, you know, we have you know, property owners who, who yeah. often come in with, with, with an application that they may not be sophisticated. May, I mean, it can be a burden if, it, if you're just talking about a regular property owner asking for a or construction of a deck and a floodplain, for instance. Well, yeah. but I do think they should notify their neighbors. It, but then you yeah. come up with how do you know that they notified their neighbors? Yeah, so what, we, so what, what is, is traditional is, is they would file an affidavit 
as part of their package. It says we notified right. these people during this period of time. Certified letters. Yeah, it was certified letters. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then to Diane's point, then you have the sign, so people are driving by. Well, yeah. that's a lot. You <laughs> do all that. That's a. I mean, that's that's. If that's I had to produce letters. the sign, that would be like a serious hassle for a, an individual but if you guys I mean I'm assuming if you were to provide a sign they'd have to pay for it am I right I mean who pays for that sign no, it, it, our signs are not we would not do a sophisticated sign okay that's fine I guess we, I'm just saying I'm trying not to give it extra on. On. yeah okay that's fine the yard yeah. sign we pulled from an intersection just, I wouldn't want to have people have to pay hundreds of dollars just to put a sign you know well okay and then you run into the okay so where does the sign have to be posted within Reasonable sight within yeah, a certain I mean, X amount of meters, there's, there's, there's or language, there's language for sure. things that used that, that, that can be clear about that. It seems like everything we do ends up on Facebook. Why not just put up a uh, something on <laughs> something on the website and then it gets linked? That are not on well, I mean, you yeah. could, you could. Well, you I, I mean, on the town side, I was being glib about Facebook. Just, just say, just say, it, say shall be posted on the website. Yeah. On our pay, on the zoning commission page. We can Certainly yeah. do that. But then the, the onus is on every single resident to like check the website all the time. You know it's, what I mean? Like, how do you know to check the website? You don't. Well, who reads the legal notices? Well, yeah, that's, that's true. true. It's, it's, it's true. true. I don't read legal notices. That's true. I don't, I, don't I don't know how many people have come here in the eighth or ninth meeting on a subject saying, <laughs> how did this happen? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. yeah. Agree. We so, had an incident a couple months ago <laughs> of the property. Um, by Abigail's. Yep. They wanted oh, to put in oh, a, yeah. a brewery, mm -hmm. yep. which was really a nice idea, but all of the neighbors suddenly showed up. They knew absolutely nothing about it. Right. I, I and that wasn't right either. Notifying the adjacent property owners or the butters, the immediately abutting properties is, is probably Why don't the you best. Grab something and see if the oh, other commissions yeah. are amenable to that. Yeah, it should be sure. standardized. I would is think. that in yeah. lieu of public notice? That that's the public notice. No, 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 no. That's no, an no, addition no. to the state statute requires the right. newspaper. Okay, I just want to make sure that that's in addition. Yeah, yeah. Notice. Okay. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. But, well, we need some, some guidance on whether the road counts as. Are they still the butters or yeah. right. across the street? Well, we can we can define a butter in any, <laughs> any, any way we'd like to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The GIS system, you can yeah. go on all the boundaries. No, but he's right. We should draft that. Yeah, you can't leave it up to what is, interpretation. Which can take a shot in. What is the yeah. enforcement okay. mechanism for Let's this? Let's move on to three. Tucker's yeah. got a question. We already. Sorry, just the enforcement mechanism. Some come, someone comes in and says, "Oh no, I forgot to put out the sign." They just. Okay, so sorry, you're, you're done. Is that it potentially invalidates the public hearing. Oh, and you'd have to just do another public hearing? Yeah. Okay, let's let's go on to the complex projects discussion. This was the letter. Yeah, we started talking about this at, at your last meeting, and it really came from our friends at the, at the Conservation Commission and the concern about you know, if there are complicated projects, would we or could we and how would we get additional third-party review? Um, and I think I reported that in, in the town, it's, just, it's really in the town code of ordinances, it says um, all boards and commissions can do that, but it has to be a complex application and the complex application is defined as uh, over 100,000 square feet of development and over 200 parking spaces. And we said we would like that change. So I, I no, I don't know. That, I don't know that you had consensus on on, um, no, on it at, at your last meeting, and so mm -hmm. we, we brought it back. <laughs> okay. And I and again, I think I think it is an option to do nothing. It is a it's a it's a it's a letter that the conservation commission is writing to the to the board of selectmen. Board of selectmen is going it, to it will review it in their context. You know what what's the impact on on you know why the wetlands commission is want to do that, but. It was copied to all, to all the chairmen, and I sent it to everybody, so it certainly worth your review. Um, I think there's there, there's value to those thresholds. There, there, there are checks. I think the Conservation Commission is you know, probably a little bit different body is that there can be wetlands impacts on complex projects, even though the project doesn't reach the thresholds that are, that are built in. And those, built, those thresholds apply to all boards and commissions. I think we should let the selectmen figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious. So what if we had a complex project and we said we want to bring in an expert? 
Is that it? Or would we have to go to the selectmen anyway? Well, that, as, as it's currently written, the, the, the Board of Selectmen has to approve that. Mm -hmm. So then, again, okay. that third party person is not, all that, what they are doing is they are reviewing the applicant's submission for errors and questions and those kinds of things. They're not redoing traffic studies. They're, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. they're not doing those things. They're, they're, checking the, they're checking the work of the other profession. That's not my understanding no, of what that my... was for. No. The, when that was first proposed, it was to do a redo. Yes, an independent. Right. An independent yeah. redo of yeah. whatever the submission that we that, Well, that's like. our. That's not how I have used them in the past. But well, uh, we okay. were here when they made it up. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, I know that's where it came from. And that's why the threshold is there well, to makes prevent sense. abuse. Yeah. And, and I don't think we've abused it. We've never I can't abused it. Abuse it right. But that's oh, a good but, thing. But when it comes to land use, when did the zoning that? commission? We have we have town engineers the zoning and commission the UPCA, and, but we no, don't have a selectman. That was a board of selectmen. Yeah. Selectman oh, that was so fair. So what would be zoning uh, uh, to review the entire project to be yeah, some project specific just concern that, we're Dunny, that, Dunny that we wanted Dunny. a third party yeah. review of? So it would be the drainage. Well, him and yeah. the consultants in here to do it. So again, I think I think doing nothing is an option, and I'm taking the board of selectmen. Have that conversation with them about the letter from conservation. Let's look. Would it be only conservation that would be able to to change it? Well, I think well, depending on what the board of selectmen, you know, depends how that conservation goes. Can it be goes. land use instead of just conservation? Can can we say the land use boards? A selectman can do anything they want yeah. in terms of yeah. right. who would apply. Right, but we have to request to them. You have an opinion on not just conservation. What if we wanted an independence traffic study? And it wasn't necessarily a complex or whatever the, you know, verbiage. If I'm it wasn't not, a complex. I'm not sure we want that. I don't think we want the power to do that. You might not, but I do. Okay, <laughs> but you're an alternate and I'm the chairman. Oh, <laughs> Jeez. It's, no. it's worth having the discussion. Okay, no, I agree with that. We're, okay. we're having the discussion. So why couldn't we have this be land use boards as opposed to just conservation commission because the conservation commission wrote a letter to the selectmen and asked them but he's asking if that's something and we, want we all it. want do we want to write a letter to the board of selectmen saying that, what do we want to say that there should be no no threshold no, I think we would defer to staff. I'm okay to have a threshold, but I don't think it should be only complex. I don't think it should be. Okay, what's the okay? What is the Definitely. what's the criteria? With it? And we could defer to staff on that. It could. I Every don't know. Time? No, we're saying George could perhaps suggest how to word it so that we could be included in oh, that. Oh, okay, right? Yeah, All sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm fair yeah. with that. Yeah. George I just love giving George more things to do. We just want your suggestion as to what you yeah. think would be best. Okay. And and we should be your expertise in, in line with conservation and ZBA and yeah. I, I think I think if it exists, the ability to do that third party review Cross should be the same across the board. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Have the same thresholds yeah. if there are any. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah, we're all about consistency tonight. Okay. There's no way any like multiple commissions would have to do their own separate. It would just be one for the whole town. Again, usually it's usually it would be topic specific. It would be right. maybe we should hire somebody to review that traffic study. Right. Or but, drainage plan yeah. or wetlands sure. survey. But could someone come forward and then okay, we say we want a new traffic study, and then the conservation says, oh well, we want the wetland study, and it, we. I so think it, that risk is there. That's that's yeah, what I mean, that but if it's a, depending on what the application is, that might be warranted. I think it, staff will tell us if it's not warranted. If we really, yeah, it, it it's it, it seems abusable to me is all. But we don't, and well, I we think don't. there's but there's enough people that can speak to the history. We haven't done that, so I think if we yeah. ask for an expert, we really want it for that application. Yeah. Okay. And as long as it is, if there's a threshold, I'm, I'm concerned because it doesn't matter. It could be really, they could just say no. 
Hmm? We don't have the well. Money. We're broke. No, I mean, I mean, I guess the board of selectmen could, but but right. you, yeah, as the check, uh, the check and the balance on it. Yes, yeah. Yeah, the, the person could withdraw. That's right. So my point is, you don't really need a limit. All you need to do is identify that on the zoning commission, we feel strongly we need a traffic engineer, a third party independent traffic engineer to review the study see who's right I mean we can't all be traffic engineers here even though we think we might be <laughs> and, and they're gonna bring in and they always do this <laughs> As Tony Barney once said I never heard a traffic engineer say there was going to be problems with that development they always get somebody to say oh no problem no problem you know and so but, but this guy was the first guy I've heard say that there'll be some impact well I don't know if he previewed that with his client <laughs> All right, I understand. Anyway, George has got it. Yeah. Let's move on to number four. Mm -hmm. We're already at 9.06. Yeah. We blame you. Do you want to? That one's you, my fault. Do you want to add it to another agenda? I would be willing to. Yeah. I mean, I would be willing to push this one off to the next meeting. So let's, that, let's put it you know, to the we can so, discuss so it. So just, just, just as a heads up, it's July 17th. We're liable uh, to have quite a full. July 17th? Yeah. Agenda on July 17th. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We always do that. July meeting is always a big meeting because we don't meet in August. Yeah. We're going to have a, 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 we're going to have at least four public hearing items. <laughs> okay, but we can do this in September. I, mean, I don't know. It doesn't I mean, have to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's I, after I can nine. put it on the agenda, but that's fine. Just tell me it's going to have a busy night. Okay. Let's. Let's. I don't let's get it. It's on the agenda. agenda. It, I don't know what it is. Oh, that was it's, my suggestion. It's planning tools and things that we can do. To, yeah. to address future residential development and make sure that we're focusing on, you know, the affordable housing and focus, make sure that we know what we want to do moving forward for residential development. And we also have the plan of conservation and development, which is going to be kind of here and talking about affordable housing and where we want this and where we want that. Yeah. So yeah. I think it would be better to wait until we see I just, that too. Yeah, I think, you know, I just want to take a more aggressive approach rather than waiting yeah, you know, okay. make sure and that the we're two could go hand in hand. Put it on your list, George. Yeah, I think we'll, the two could go hand in hand. Make, yeah. it, make it appear an agenda that's make not so crowded. Okay, okay. they absolutely should go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. OCD is absolutely where we want to be. Yeah, making those plans. Yeah. Okay. And being that that's being developed right now, it, yeah, yeah, they're almost mm -hmm. time is of the essence. So yeah. I okay. Spent two hours reading three hundred pages I today. I look through it. Too. I like reading. Okay. Can we have a motion to adjourn? Oh, we had that one more. What? We have one more item. Right on. Just like I've been waiting. I, I just want, I just want to remind you yes. the, the, the the plan of conservation and development is on the website. It's a draft form. We are having a public input session, a presentation of the draft, and a public input session next Tuesday night Tuesday. Okay. at the regular meeting of the planning Thank commission. But we're going to have it. At the library. Yes. So the 27th, right? Yes, Tuesday. At the library. Oh, I've even got it on my phone already. Look at that. I probably told you about it, but as a reminder. Okay. Now you may. Now we can go. And you want to? Sure. I make a motion that we uh, adjourn this meeting at 9 10. 9 10. Sure. So here, second. Second. Second by. Tony. Welcome, Tony. Excellent. All, all in favor. Aye. 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 Aye